or may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as you may have heard, uh, I wasn't planning on preaching here this morning, but circumstances change. And so, on Thursday and Friday, I sat asking myself what today's Gospel passage had to say to this congregation here in Shawbury. And there were so many things that spoke to me. Firstly, the Lord appointed 70 people. 70. That's more than double our regular Sunday congregation. That's more than the number of people, if you add all the three churches that I've been in today, that's more than all of those people. So when Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few, you ain't kidding, Jesus. And in that moment, he's got twice as many people as we have. It might feel a bit like we're scuppered before we even start. But please note that whilst the Lord had 70 to send out, he sent them out in pairs. When we consider the task before us, it can seem incredibly daunting. But it's always more daunting when you think that the task is yours alone. Jesus didn't send out his followers on their own, certainly not at this point anyway. Yet he did consider two people working together to be a sufficient number for mission to take place. And it's worth remembering that later in this same chapter, the 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. So I wonder if you're feeling alone and a bit on a limb, or maybe like a lamb amongst wolves, as Jesus put it. Well, in case you haven't spotted it, in the two years that I've been here, I've been trying to foster a sense of calling in each one of us to take responsibility for preaching, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in the world. I'm very much aware that for some of you, this will be a significant change in your, from your previous understanding of church, of faith and of mission. In the last century, we've moved from a situation where everybody in the UK went to church on a Sunday, so you didn't have to share the good news because the vicar did it from the pulpit. To a situation where only 2% of people in England are regular attenders at Church of England churches. Obviously, there are some additional churchgoers from Baptist, Catholic and other denominations. But the vast majority of people in this country are not regular attenders. And many of them have never been attenders for more than one generation. So there is now a distinct lack of understanding regarding the Christian faith. We cannot just sit here and expect people to know about Jesus Christ. Times have changed. But that's scary, because you've not really been asked to be missionaries before. So I want you to know that you are not alone in this. I want you to realise that you are not alone in this. It might be that you are already partnering with someone in your family, or someone from this congregation. Or you can think of me as your mission partner if you prefer but you also have the Holy Spirit as the greatest mission partner ever. When we don't know what to say or do, if we ask God and put our trust in him, the Holy Spirit will guide us. But going back for a moment to being in partnership with me, I've suggested all sorts of things for you to do and be in the last 28 months. I'm sure that if I pushed you, most of you would be able to name maybe one or two of those things if I really pushed you. 
but I do promise that I'm doing my best to make it as easy for you as I can. I'm not asking you to go out on street corners and preach a sermon. Not yet, anyway. Sometimes it's as simple as inviting a friend to the Alpha course. Or even just to drop one of these invitations through their letterbox. That's mission. And it is effective. Speaking of which, I want you to know the plan for Christmas this year. Our PCCs have made the decision in all three churches that we can't hold our traditional carols and lessons services this year. It's not practical, it's not realistic. So in case you've missed this, we're going to record the Christmas story and we're going to share it online. I finished editing the script this week. It is all in rhyming couplets and I'm very proud of my rhymes for Gabriel, Caesar and Palace. And Daniel's heard it, he's checked it, he says it's all right. So if Daniel thinks it's okay, it's great. I've already got about 15 people signed up to record themselves. But I've got space, I reckon, for about 30 or 40 people in the recording. If you don't know how to record yourself on your phone or a tablet like an, an iPad, then I will find a way to record you in church at the end of the service. So I would much rather that you signed up and said, yes, I'm in, and, uh, and I will find a way to help you be in. So once it has been uploaded, I'm gonna be asking you to share it with absolutely everyone and anyone that you can think of. There'll be an email that I send out that you can share with your family and friends. See, not just in this parish, not just in the benefice, with your family and friends, okay? There will be posts about it on social media that you can share to your own Facebook posts, for example. And I'm planning to advertise through flyers, just like we did for Alpha, just like we did for Alpha this year. Now, by the end of 2020, I'm estimating that we will have spent somewhere in the region of 25 to 30,000 pounds on repairs to this building alone in one year, possibly more. In that time, in that year, my budget for mission will have been, I think, 100 pounds, which has gone on advertising the Alpha course. And in fact, that was money that we received in a grant last year anyway. So my real budget has been zip. So in the next month, I'm going to be asking each of you and the congregations in the other two churches as well to contribute financially towards our Christmas mission. £90 gets us 5,000 flyers like this. And we need some A3 posters as well. So I'm going to be asking you to put your hand in your pocket to allow us to declare the good news of Jesus Christ in as many homes as possible in the run-up to Christmas. I'm asking each of you for two pound or a bit more, if you can afford it, in addition to what you already give to the church as a way to boost our publicity efforts. Not with the primary intention of publicizing this church or the benefits, but with our main focus being about telling people about Jesus Christ. I started that this morning at St. Bartholomew's. I can tell you there were three people in the congregation at St. Bartholomew's this morning. I have 22 pounds in this box already. This box is going at the back next to the other collection plate. Please, I'm gonna keep bugging you about it. The more I've got, the more I'm spending on mission, all right, and I'm excited about that. Chris is waving at me. You can give online as well. There you go. All right. You can give online as well. All right. But if you're giving online, tell Chris that it's for mission. Even then, you might think that this all seems a bit of a daunting task for our benefits. But there are 2.4 billion Christians in the world. So you are part of one of the biggest teams in the universe. We just need to play our part and let others play theirs. We do our best, God will do the rest.
Now, while all that's bouncing around in your mind, allow me to continue with the Bible passage. Because Jesus doesn't say, there aren't many labourers, so you're going to have to do all the work. What he actually says is, therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. In other words, pray. I want to be absolutely clear about this. A church that isn't absolutely devoted to prayer is a church that is mistaken in its priorities. And I'm not just talking about prayer at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning and 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning. I'm talking about prayer in our lives. I didn't spend time creating prayer guides in order to look busy or to seem holy. I didn't create them for them to sit on pews and stay on pews. I created them for people across our churches to take home and use in their daily devotions to guide their prayers, to guide my prayers, and to inspire prayer that flows from those prayers. So you don't just pray that, but you say, what God are you asking me to do as part of that? Or, God, how can we go on from that and do something more? And then listen for the answer. That's an important part of prayer. And I didn't choose to run the prayer course during Lent this year because, well, that's what you do at Lent and the prayer course is a nice easy one to run. I chose it because prayer is a fundamental pillar of a life of faith, because prayer is transformative. As Margaret reminds us often, pray and you will get it. Thank you, Margaret. So with that in mind, I pray every week for this church, much more than every week, in fact. I pray that God will guide me on how I can lead this church in the best way possible, developing it into the most uplifting, sustaining, encouraging and empowering community that we can be. Now, I believe that we are rapidly approaching a watershed moment, not just here at St Mary's, but also as a wider diocese. In fact, I'm not alone in that. The Bishop of Litchfield this week sent a letter to all clergy, lay ministers and church wardens saying as such. In fact, I'm going to read a little bit of what the Bishop of Litchfield had to say. As we rebuild our churches for the future, locally and across the diocese, it is clear that there will be many differences from the past. The choice ahead of us is not whether to change or not. Change is happening at a fast pace all around us. And the choices we have to make are about how to change, how to listen for God's calling to us for the present and for the future. To ensure that we make these choices and respond to these changes in an intentional way, we, the diocese, are establishing a deanery-based programme called Shaping for Mission. Remember that name, Shaping for Mission, because you're going to hear it a lot in the next 12 months, I suspect. My hope, says Bishop Michael, is that this will help us to make future decisions, <coughs> excuse me, including financial ones, according to God's vision for us, rather than simply in order to balance the books. We do indeed have serious financial challenges to face, but even more serious are the missional opportunities being presented to us. Now, I'm very glad that Bishop Michael has made clear that the diocese has to make some financial decisions. The diocese has agreed to support the parishes for three years, including this year, to cap catch any shortfall. But after that, cuts will be coming. But what's even more gladdening in what he's written is that he's indicated that our future decisions have to be according to God's vision and that our most serious challenge is mission. So if you think something else is more important than mission at the moment, Bishop Michael says you're wrong. So much has changed since today's Gospel passage was first written by Luke. 
If you place one of those 70 people to whom Jesus spoke into a 21st century Britain, their head would probably explode with how different the world is now. Yet in many ways, nothing has changed at all. We are still being sent out by Christ into the world. Our financial concerns remain a worry, but we are told to trust in a God who has plans for us. We feel like lambs among wolves when we go out into the world. But God's kingdom has come near and the Father chooses to use us to declare it. So I hope and pray that you will partner with me, with each other and with the Holy Spirit in mission. I hope that this sermon has reminded you that mission is something to which you are called, not just by me, but by Jesus Christ himself. And I really hope that this sermon will sit uneasy with you, because you know I'm right, and there is so much more to be done. Amen.